All right, everybody. Welcome to the San Diego Comic Con at Home panel on world builders, uh, the evolution of immersive entertainment. I'm your host, David Bloom. I am a writer for a variety of publications such as Forbes and Next TV and TV Rev and uh, do a podcast. And I am blessed to have uh, six really sharp people who are going to make me look good. Um, I will introduce each of them and let them talk slightly about each of their own backgrounds. And we're going to get into things like the future of uh, VR, virtual reality, and augmented reality, and um, some of the virtual production tools that are being uh, used out there. As Hollywood transforms, we want to kind of look. This is being recorded before uh, it's running. So unfortunately, we won't be able to take audience questions, but we'll try to keep your questions in my mind virtually and uh, ask them of uh, this assembled mass of uh, brilliance here in front of us. Uh, let's start. Um, Emily, why don't you, uh, Emily Jolie, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about Zoe and what you guys do? Hey, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Nice to see you. Um, I am Emily. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Ape Lab. Um, I'm background is I'm an interaction designer um, and I've been working in the AR VR space for 10 years now already started at university um, and we've been building a whole bunch of production tools uh, internally over the years but um, we just released last year a software called Zoe and Zoe allows students um, starting at 12 13 years old to build their own interactive um, content inside virtual reality. So we have a big focus on, um, you know, working with kids and then getting them into these tools and start basically creating their own stories and their own experiences. All right, great. Kwaku Anning, the director of the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurial Thinking. I'm all for that. Uh, Kwaku, tell us a bit about what the center does and, and how you got this amazing gig. Yeah, I, sometimes I wonder the same thing. I got this amazing <laughs> game. As long as your employer's done, okay. But, uh. <laughs> right. I, I, fingers crossed. They're still happy with me. Um, I actually work here in San Diego uh, as part of the San Diego Jewish Academy. And um, my job is basically three things on a minor level. I run our IT department. Um, I also work with our staff and students to find interesting and cohesive ways to embed technology into curriculum. And then the final piece is I get to experiment and play with a lot of emerging tech and bring it back to the school and find opportunities for students and teachers to learn how to use that more as well. And in fact, last summer, Emily and I partnered up on uh, an immer like a, a immersive tech camp um, where kids used, uh, learned how to use AR and VR to create narratives around um, uh, global warming, climate change, that sort of thing. Great. Uh, Brooks Brown uh, is co-founder and CCO of a company whose name I cannot even pronounce. It's Vervi. 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 V-I-R-V-I-I. -I -I. So you can, you can understand why it looks to me like it's something from Serbia, perhaps. Well, we, we tried to make it a little on the, on the odd side. Uh, our, our world is, uh, I come from virtual reality just prior to this. Uh, uh, and uh, Vervi was founded on the idea of trying to eschew reality and play more with the virtual inside of AR, XR, VR all the R's and all the acronyms for R's, uh, we like to just coin it uh, immersive, just generalized immersive or real time uh, because That's we play- so much easier, right? I mean, right. <laughs> we can't, we, we have so many flavors of uh, non-reality that- we Yeah, and, and one of the big uh, troubles we've seen, uh, at least in my past projects and other things that we had done as a group is as you try to push more into that reality side, uh, the, the effort becomes Herculean and almost exponential. And so how do we play more with the virtual side and really pushing what is possible inside of just how people perceive the experiences they're in? Okay. Asad, you are uh, Asad Malik, the founder of IRIC, which I am told is doing really cool things in augmented reality, but you've got your hands in a lot of stuff. Talk a little bit about IRIC. Sure. So um, we pronounce it one Rick. Um, essentially, it's a studio that we've been doing a lot of augmented reality work for the last couple of years. Um, so it's a numeral we, one, Rick. Okay. I, you know, I got, I got bad typefaces. What can I tell you? You're good. You're good. Uh, yeah. So basically, we've been explicitly working with augmented reality only. You know, we make a conceptual differentiation between what VR achieves and what AR achieves. And we kind of emphasize the AR aspect. Um, so we had a project called Terminal 3 at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2018. Um, and we had another project called Adjuster's Tale at Sundance last year. So, you know, these were elaborate kind of narrative experiences, one built on the Hull and one on the Magic Leap. 
that's kind of the history we're coming from. Um, but since then, the studio has expanded significantly, and now we have full slate of projects. Uh, we're doing a bunch of educational experiences with Verizon that will be deployed in around 200 schools over the next few months. Um, and we have a, a new platform called Jadu that we launched a few months ago, which is essentially volumetric holograms of musicians um, that kids and fans can then dance and make videos with and then post them on TikTok and Snapchat. So it becomes somewhat of a social network that has this engagement with, with holograms. And that pl platform has really been doing well. So we raised some financing over the last month and are slated to produce around 350 holograms over the next year. So okay. That's a lot of holograms. It's a lot of that's a lot of uh, Humphrey Bogarts walking around in the world. So right. possibly you'll have something more current um, among your holograms. Um, Isabel, you are Isabel Riva, head of media and entertainment innovations for Unity Technology, one of the two, I guess, two most dominant platforms in this sort of VR creation space. Talk a little bit about what you're doing with Unity and where you all are going. Um. Sure, thank you for having us. We're very excited to participate in this dialogue. So um, I work in labs at Unity and we're definitely focused on the future and positioning the, the engine and the, and the services that we offer um, in a place where we expect uh, entertainment will land three years, five years down the road. So we're very, very focused on incubating potential new solutions or products that that are agile and react to uh, societal changes like we've seen recently. Um, and we're focused on, in m and &E, use cases outside of video games. So how can a 3D real-time engine service the music industry? Or how could we bring television into the 21st century? These are the types of uh, problems we're examining and um, prototyping solutions and in, in trying to sort of work with creators in the community to to listen to what's needed um that that's pretty much what my group is dedicated to okay and ted uh, shilowitz is a futurist the futurist for paramount pictures he has probably the coolest title in hollywood as far as i'm concerned um coolest gig uh, ted talk a little bit about what it means to be a futurist for uh, old school 110 year old movie studio uh, now part of a uh, merged media company that's basically broadcast and film and um, cable TV and trying to get bigger in this whole streaming thing. So wh what's, what's it like? What are you doing? So, so I work for this large organization called Viacom CBS, of which Paramount is a important and key part of one of the divisions of the larger group. Um, my job is is interesting and fascinating, as you as you bring up, David. A lot of people find it sort of fascinating that a movie studio would have someone called a futurist, um, which in some ways is correct and in some ways is a bit of a misnomer. Um, more than anything, I'm actually an explorer, um, or I like to sort of comically say I'm a professional frog kisser. Um, <laughs> Because you got to kiss a lot of frogs. I think a lot of people in Hollywood are professional frog killer, kissers. I'm just going to say, they're just hoping they get a prince but, or a princess. But uh, there's a lot of that going on anyway, but not, not yeah. at your level. Yeah, and well, that's, you, you sort of beat me to the punch. That's basically the idea is that um, you're constantly looking and exploring and learning. Isabel, I think, does something very similar from a much purer technology, software-driven um, organization, we are a, a little bit looser, so we use all the tools and all the personnel and all the talent out there to essentially try and find um, this, this broad term that we like to refer to as innovation, right? Um, and so, so the, if you kind of want to define a little bit of what my job is, it's really looking at the intersection of technology and storytelling. Um, and where does it work and how does it modernize and how does it affect different audiences. So the bulk of the people on this panel, on this virtual panel, uh, I'm fans of. I've been tracking their existence and what they're doing and why they're doing it and doing my best to just kind of keep it moving along the track and hopefully find success uh, for all of them. So what Ted's saying is like the Chinese government, he's watching all of you. And um, so don't, don't <laughs> think that at all. Uh, he's a really nice guy. Um, 
in terms of where we are um, here in the middle of a pandemic, uh, in the wake of extended concern about uh, racial injustice and all that, um, the uh, it, it, what looks like an ongoing uh, substantial recession affecting our economy, um, what and much else. 5G is coming down the, the pike very fast uh, on the mobile side. We, we have artificial intelligence informing more and more uh, corporate operations and, and decisions, even in places like Hollywood and education. Uh, it's a really interesting time. Where I, I guess first we'd like to sort of an assessment of the state of VR and AR, I mean, and, and where it's going to be. Um, I'm, as I've mentioned to you guys, I'm working on a project right now looking at what what Hollywood looks like in 2022, but a lot of you guys are doing work in education and other sectors. Uh, what does VR, what does AR look like in the next 18 months and where is it now? Uh, let's start with Brooks. Well, VR right now is in a, uh, I, I almost want to say a wonderful spot. Is that the nice part about uh, the, the, the COVID side of things is that it gave a lot of people a chance to realize that you can actually be at home more often than you thought you could, that you get to spend more time with your family, you get to do more things. But at the same time, it took away a lot of really amazing opportunities for entertainment. The Vervy was founded originally uh, as we were starting to figure out what can we do as a secondary thing with musical artists. My CEO comes from streaming music, you know, working with artist management, and uh, we spent a year working on, well, what el what's an alternative to concerts that isn't just a concert in VR? What is an alternative to music videos? What does uh, streaming look like in VR? We spent a year on that, and uh, we signed our partnership with Facebook the week that COVID actually made everyone go home. So it was a really unique moment. Timing's time. everything, right? Timing is, the, the luck is extraordinary. And uh, what we've been able to see over the last few months is uh, Oculus and a lot of people step up production. A lot of people really make that adoption into what is a big shift in how people take in content uh, by pushing to VR, pushing to secondary platforms. Uh, and for us, it's been uh, really good to see because it's, you know, you said right before this talk that uh, somehow in the last uh, just few months, we've basically made 10 years of kind of sea change when it comes to how people adopt media and how people adopt innovations in what it means to take in that media. And I'm, I'm just excited about it because it, it opens up opportunities for people who possibly before didn't have opportunity to see stuff. As a kid who grew up in Denver in the 80s, it wasn't at the time the biggest concert place in the world. Certainly wasn't Los Angeles where I lived. We had now. Red Rocks and that was about we, it. We right? had Red Rocks, which was great, but we didn't have the Viper Room. We didn't have all of these amazing places with stand-up comedians, with performances, with talks, with art museums, with everything cultural. And now we've got a place and a, and a way for us to actually have people experience that if they're in Tulsa or some small city in Northern California or Montana, that they get to have the same kind of cultural experiences people around the country can have. And I think that's really powerful. Okay. Um, Isabel, from your standpoint, they're in the belly of the beast at Unity, um, but somebody who's looking down the road for Unity, where, 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 are the, uh, where are we now and where are the opportunities that you all see for VR? You talked about expanding beyond games, which is obviously what you all have done very well in, in the mobile space in particular, but beyond that, uh, where, where, where are we and where are we going to be in a year and a half? Well, like Brooks, I'm very excited because, I mean, despite unfortunate circumstances, we're in a very uh, creative and rich environment right now where people are accelerating the adoption of uh, new, new ways to consume, new ways to produce content. But what I'm noticing is pr previously people were consuming content alone and now they want to consume content together. They're starved for social contact. And so what I found is that- Virtually together, potentially. Virtually. Like, right. They want to be together even though they're apart. And that's a very powerful uh, behavior, a desire that, I'm, that um, we're interested in because real-time engines and game engines have been doing this in video games forever. We've been bringing people together in a space to play from all over the place. We've been, we've been doing that with MMOs and all kinds of online games. 
So imagining now, for instance, how do we translate that into new industries like music, um, like film? I mean, we're seeing apps pop up like Netflix Party and, right. and all of the, you know, um, all kinds of ways people are plexing technologies together to allow for a multi-user environment. So yeah, I, I think, think that's really that's really important. I mean, how do you uh, create that virtual theater experience almost and and consumption, but also the sharing and conversation and all that really is interesting. And there are some tools that are nascent, but are out there, right? Not just Netflix Party. Oh no, gosh! I mean, we have, um, for instance, we've got a voice chat technology, Vivox, which serves you know players so that they can talk to each other inside of a space. We have uh, load balancing server technology so that you could play from all over the world, but we'll find the server that renders for you in a most efficient, no latency way. There's a lot of components that have been built up in the industry for MMOs and big like World of Warcraft type games, right. which are now extremely relevant to entertainment if we, we can no longer, you know, go to the movie theater, go to the stadium for the concert and, and, and commune with, with, um, with others in the consumption of art. So let's, if we do it in the virtual space, where I think we are, we're going to be in a year, is going to be the virtualization of, um, you know, of these new temples of entertainment you know, the virtual music concert. How much further can we take it so that it feels a little more real? Um, the virtualization of the movie theater. Can we watch a movie at the same time as other people laugh, cry, talk about it while we're watching, even though look we're at our not phone. together? I mean, right, we can look at our phone and annoy everybody. That's, that's a good one, so. <laughs> it's, there, it's really interesting. So for me, it's about concurrent users. It's about as many people at scale together, global audiences consuming the same content. We're, you know, it's about being together. It's, it's really, it's really that. And it's in that kind of, that brings social interactivity into the mix and interaction models become interesting through the, that lens. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Cause I remember, uh, gosh, a couple of years ago now, I went to go see, I think it was Next VR, which got bought by Apple recently, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they were doing uh, live VR broadcasts of soccer matches. And it was pretty cool. The experience was pretty cool what they were doing. They went down to see them do some stuff with the LA Galaxy down in the south side of uh, Los Angeles' metropolitan area, um, the MLS team. And it was fun to see it. But I noticed that, that the thing that was missing was you could have the best seat in the house. VR wise, but you couldn't really share it. And that felt like you could see the fans in VR, but you couldn't really interact with the fans that were there watching. And so part of it is not just in the same room, but connecting and reacting and sharing and cheering together and all that stuff, right? And that's mm -hmm. the next stage. I don't know, if mm -hmm. it's but, but like watching a comedy in a movie theater is different than watching a comedy by yourself in your home. It's different when there's a group of people laughing. Or going yeah. to a comedy, a comedy uh, uh, stand-up guy talking, or, or a woman doing her doing her her pieces, a different experience. So, so you feel like we'll be able to capture a little bit more of that in a virtual way, a little bit more of that that communal experience in a yes. meaningful way. Okay. Yes, I think that that's my. I mean, that's an objective of ours to sort of explore, um, to explore the social you know, consumption of, of content um, in a virtual platform. So, okay. so, so, so the sing-along, you know, can, you, can we pull that off in, in, a, in a video game technology? The, the audio latency would be insane to solve for, but right. that's the kind of thing Unity is interested in. Huh. So, yeah, just having, uh, I mean, uh, I had friends reach out to me and say, what's a good site besides Zoom to be able to... Um, I, I want to get with my pals and jam on some music and like, maybe it's like six or eight people. Right. But they want to play together. They want to play for a while, but like, how do you do that? Just having this, the audio synced up is a gigantic challenge. Right. Mm -hmm. Next to impossible. I do that, David. It's, it's a real thing. You can do it. it it's, it's a real thing. And, and, and it's Ted a nightmare though, Ted, like it takes a Ted to do it. That's the it problem. Takes a Ted, yeah. Yeah, it, it definitely <laughs> is not simple and it requires a new book, uh, by the way, it takes, it takes a Ted. 
Um, but but there's a software called Jam Kazam that uh, okay. we use and our buddies use. And it, you know, you have to have the right stuff. But I've done guitar singing little jam sessions with uh, with my buddies in it, and it works. Cool. Now, are you running off of like a six gigabit? Uh, um, connection? I'm, well. I could tell you my whole my whole uh, story of, of my internet provider and fighting my uphill battle to, like, run my speed tests and explain to them over and over again that this is what I pay for and this is what I'm getting. Right, right. Well, you know, it's, that, that's another story and for another panel, no doubt. But I mean, it is interesting that one of the things that's happening is not just people are willing to use Zoom like your grandmother that or, or your mom, but they're willing to go get a better connection and a better screen in their house and uh, a little webcam that's better than the crappy one in their computer and maybe a stand-up mic or a, some kind that they can speak into because it, all of a sudden it's a different dynamic. So they appreciate that experience and they're, they're improving the home experience, which I think actually encourages things. And they're not just getting the, the Oculus, they're getting whatever they get. Uh, but I think that's probably part of this too. Uh, aside, now you, Another component of this is not just what the consumer does, but how we create the stuff to get get it to the consumer. You and Ted, I think, can speak to this in particular about how we produce some of this content in sure. virtual ways. So talk a little bit about how that's happening and where that's going, if both of you guys could jump in on that. Sounds good. Yeah, so um, it's funny because we launched Jadu a couple of months ago and uh, there's the app that I was just describing where, you know, we're essentially placing volumetric holograms of different artists that then fans can get into the videos with them and record videos. And, you know, like we've been doing a lot more complex kind of stuff than usually is in these festivals, but always the idea was that we wanted to make something that could actually reach out to a mainstream consumer audience and they can start engaging with and getting familiar with realistic volumetrics and, you know, what that kind of content looks like. Um, and so we basically took this idea and tried to simplify it as much as possible, remove a lot of the elements that we would otherwise have in our experiences, like voice recognition and things of that nature, and kind of blended it out to just be this 15 second looping performance with the upcoming single or the release, very reminiscent of formats that, you know, things like TikTok, TikTok now have uh, popularized. So we launched and it was really funny because, you know, we had five artists launching on the platform at that time. All their audiences went, got the app and started making a lot of videos. And these videos at this point have millions of views on TikTok. You know, it's quite fascinating for people to see a, a famous person be in their friend's video that they didn't expect. And it became pretty obvious very quickly that, you know, like labels spend a lot of money on music videos and things of that nature just to promote a single. Right. But the appeal to actually share a music video is not really there in the same way as someone would rather share a video of them with their favorite artist, you know, right. on their this Instagram. Now Cameo's whole business model is about that, right? So you're really doing it in a sort of a VR version of Cameo, it feels like. Exactly. So imagine Cameo, but you're in the video with the artist and right. you don't have to pay the artist. Um, right. and they're that's not just in the way. Zoom room. They're in, your, they're in with you. Exactly. Um, like so yeah, as soon as we did that, COVID kind of became a cherry on top in a weird way. Like, you know, it's incredibly unfortunate and, you know, our, all our personal lives are suffering in one way or the other, but, um, suddenly all these major labels were getting in touch with us to see if this can be on the platform because everyone's tours were canceled. And that's kind of their only avenue of engaging with artists in a way that's that intimate. Um, so without really requiring headsets or anything of that nature, a fan could just download the app and be in a place where they could be, you know, checking out both new artists and also, you know, having holograms of their favorite artists in their space. So, you know, just especially during COVID, we started seeing a lot of really interesting videos of people using things like moss or like playing a prank on their dad that, you know, they were like, oh, my, this band member is in my room and the dad's like, I don't believe you. And then showing a video, of, oh, look, no, he really is there. And we saw moments like, for example, we have this artist, K-Camp, who has the Renegade song on TikTok. It's the most used song on TikTok of all time. And we made a hologram of him. And he placed the hologram in a grocery store where a bunch of people were stocking up on toilet paper. And he posted that video to his Instagram. And it was on the news because people thought he was actually doing live performances in grocery stores. They, um, so that realism of volumetrics is really kind of coming through in that sense. Right, right. It leads to lots of questions about what's real and what's not. And 
what we can believe online. Ted, you, uh, I'm curious about how much uh, at this point Paramount is using some of the kinds of tools that Assad's talking about and some of the other guys have been talking about uh, in its uh, day-to-day -day production needs for film. And, and I guess, is the Paramount Network connected with you guys or just has your all's name within the family? Um, it's us. It's yeah. you guys, so. Yeah, what, what's interesting, and actually most of the really cutting edge technologies are things that I'm actually doing uh, external to Paramount and Viacom proper. Uh, and sort of fold in when they're at a maturity level that uh, can be used at a sort of a professional scale um, that, that isn't really uh, at existence yet for VR and AR. So for example, uh, one of the projects I've been involved in since COVID started, I'm involved in a, a foundation that's all about youth activism for media. And for years we would donate red cameras to these documentary filmmakers, these kid documentary filmmakers to go out and, and make um, media for change and media for social good. Um, over the past, you know, I guess, well, it's over three months now, and by the time people watch this, it'll be four months. Right. Um, the center where we work out of for the foundation was totally closed down. So uh, we turned it into a full social distancing volumetric capture studio using an 8K RED camera for like a 2.5D version using iOS and AR kit um, to do this kind of virtual hologram, but hyper photorealistic. I actually have some some slides and some videos. I know uh, Scott and Mark, who are hosting the panel, asked if I would pull things up, which I, this will give you a sense of it. Exploration and exploration that we're doing with a small startup out of San Diego called Emily that has an application that allows augmented video to be real and hyper photorealistic. So a couple days ago, we've been doing a lot of shooting, a lot of experimenting. A couple days ago, we shot a musical artist, a, a songwriter, singer named Joe Sumner. So I'm going to launch him on the app. I'm going to fire up the uh, stage in our living room here, and it's looking for a stage to place him. And there he is. Hi, I'm Joe Sumner. So and I'm size him up. So nice. And now you can see he's basically in the living room, right? Right. During the COVID-19 pandemic. And now I'm going to hand off to play a song for you. It's called Hope. the iPad, and I'm going to go sit and watch. So, I have to say, he looks shorter in the video. <laughs> it's sort of like the exact opposite of Hollywood. He looks shorter in the video instead of taller. Now, this is the best part coming up. When I move behind it. Oh, you got some occlusion going on? Yep. So you get the idea. Yeah. Cool. All right, so some of that stuff's kind of going on, and that shows what's possibly this will get only better as we get along. Uh, yeah, so if anybody's interested in that, I can share other links and stuff. We've been testing and proving it out, and okay. just like Assad is doing, there's... Uh, a lot of possibilities, but it's very much at the beginnings of trying to understand where all this is going. Great. But we are seeing, I mean, uh, Isabel, um, Unity was used in the production of The Lion King, for instance. And I think you guys, did you guys get used for uh, Mandalorian as well? Because it was some of the same players, if I recall. It's, it's, it's similar, but, but we were used for Lion King. Um, Magnopus built a virtual production system using our, our real-time rendering engine. And what it enabled was to have the director Favreau and his keys, his, 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 his leads from the departments, cinematography, costume design, everybody in the actual same uh, headgear looking at the same 3D scene. So they were scouting, tech scouting, and uh, discussing, um, you know, sort of like, uh, uh, like, figuring out camera angles and costumes in the context of a 3D scene. So it's like post-production has come all the way forward into actual production. And there's no more sort of fix it and pose. There's no more guessing. It's a, it's a much sort of, um, it's much more modern way of, uh, of shooting a, a CG fueled movie. Sure. Um, is this something, Ted, that you that some of your people are doing? Yeah, so we're we are heavily heavily involved in this, both with Unity and uh, Epic. Um, and what uh, Unity just launched on the mixed reality side is super interesting with their Mars initiative, 
which is fantastic to sort of further that process. But in the sort of generalized game engine as virtual set and virtual production, um, we are gearing up and ramping up effectively to shoot on location without shooting on location. So we're building the technology that allows us to be able to, as opposed to putting people on real airplanes, we'll put people on virtual airplanes and pretend that they flew halfway around the world to shoot in India, Bulgaria. Do they have virtual jet lag? <laughs> they will have to make virtual jet lag. That would be an interesting thing to do. <laughs> That's but the general idea is that you can bring, you can basically bring the world to you. So we can build virtual sets in 3D, hyper photorealistic, shoot in high fidelity, create the illusion that we actually went to location to shoot this stuff. Uh, and that is a viable pursuit that we are absolutely 100% in, in the deep end of the pool. And that, that ultimately can save a lot of money in the production process. I mean, if you're not having to, I mean, particularly now, given the situation that we're in and the concerns about safety on sets and all that. Um, speaking of safety and all those kinds of issues, I'm really interested in the education space, another place that involves a lot of very analog process. Um, so where where is this going with education, both primary and uh, secondary and uh, college level? I mean, I'm sort of curious what you guys are saying. Definitely in the educational space right now. I've been on a Zoom call with 200 students, and that was just crazy. Everyone was sleeping. Oh, <laughs> and, I can't, I can't you know, imagine. Well. you can speak to that as well, well probably taught, more than I, I do. classes at, at USC and, and, uh, and guest lecture in lots of places, and 200 kids in a virtual space must be chaotic, right? I mean, yeah. how do you it's chaotic and I think also one of the big thing that's missing at least for the younger ones is the engagement that they have with each other usually like they'll they'll just go on the zoom and then they'll just go to minecraft to, to meet right. and greet right? right so you know um, but I can pop in a little bit about what we're doing so our big focus is enabling um, students to be creative and to build things so together inside a virtual environment um, but the more important thing is that everything in here is going to be fully interactive. So what Zoe does is basically allowing them to build a 3D environment, but then to learn how to program and how to actually code some of the behaviors. So this is like a very quick scene. And some of the models that you see here were actually built by 12 year olds. So this is why they look like that. But you could also pull in anything that's super high end in there. But for the purpose of talking about what we're doing with um, students, I'm just going to show a little bit about, you know, how that works. So there's a couple of exercises here. This is like a little scene where they can kind of get their hands around how this works and how to start creating a story or start creating a game. So, I mean, one of the challenges it looks like is you're going to have to teach them the difference between physics and physics. Yeah, right. No. Right. So I mean, game physics versus the real world, and I don't know, conservation of energy or something. Yeah, it's also a lot about you know game design and interaction design, and just learning how you know all of this stuff works and how you actually build it. And we, of course, well, we're we're built on top of Unity, but and we also have a plugin inside Unity, but this is standalone, so it works on like on the Oculus Quest headsets. So students can pull in assets from a library, but they can also just go directly into uh, online libraries. Uh, we're adding Sketchfab now, so they can go and pull in things from their Chillbrush projects or their Google Blocks projects, if they have any. Um, and then you can do a whole bunch of things in there. So for example, this is an exercise on how to learn how physics works. So if you press play, nothing happens because your objects don't have any gravity or any kind of physics. So when you click on them, you can decide what you want to do with them. So you can say, mm, I want to be able to add gravity to the ball. I want to be able to grab it. And I also want it to collide with other things. So you can just kind of set up your settings and then you learn kind of how to build these things out. And then now you can start playing around with your ball. Okay. So are nice. kind of like the basic things here. Um, and then you can do a whole bunch of interactions. So you can record audio clips. You can um, say, I don't know if I, um, put this uh, water bottle on the flower, then it will grow, you know, all those types of things. So you're really learning how to create interactivity and how to build your, your story. So, so uh, and then I guess that's where the UI really and the user experience becomes really complicated and important. Where, right? where I think this is interesting, David, is that uh, in, the, in the mixed reality world, it's quite advanced now, but now also in the virtual reality world, in the low cost consumer virtual reality world, uh, hand tracking is is really starting to take shape and in oh, an oculus right. quest there's already a lot of really good hand interactions so 
a lot of the things that you would do with a controller, which feels a little like I've got to learn it, you right. can, the next generation is just use your hands and click in the air and assume that it's there. And it's, all it's, that's it's, also a, 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 a wonderful developer has actually created uh, with hand tracking on the quest, the ability for people to learn sign language, yeah. which okay. is yeah, like it, it, accessibility, like we've never seen inside of technology. It's incredible. Right. So, and, and there's more coming. It's just, we're just emerging into mm -hmm. learning how to use it. And so yeah, you, you also see depending on how, how detailed you want to be doing things and you know, like hand tracking works in a certain way, but there's not a lot of like feedback and stuff. So it's, it gets hard when you want to do precise things. That's the only thing so far. Yeah. Uh, uh, Quarko, I'm interested from your standpoint, what you're seeing about how we uh, bring this stuff to education and more importantly, how we bring access to this stuff in education. Uh, you work for a nonprofit, I think, probably trying to improve that access. But I mean, it's, a, it's like it's great if uh, the suburban white kid school gets access to a really cool VR experience. But how do we get this stuff to under-resourced schools? How do we make it compelling and useful for them? And how do we not leave them behind, as has so often happened with technology in the past? That's actually a really, really, really great question. I, I was actually speaking on something similar to this last Friday. Um, essentially, I was giving a talk about how this medium, this form of storytelling is the latest in this timeline of tools that we've used going back to like the printing press, the internet, television, radio, all of that. And uh, I was speaking to a group of teachers who primarily work with students of color in the, in the sort of uh, neighborhoods that you're talking about. And the purpose of the talk was to just to say, hey, this is something that exists. And this is something that we need to be sharing with all kids. Because at the end of the day, if kids of color don't understand this creation process, then their stories aren't part of this larger canon that is being recorded by this technology. Um, and so right now, it feels like the largest challenge around that is the logistics of getting hardware to those to those settings. There's a money aspect of it as well, but you know, I, I know earlier someone mentioned that Oculus has stepped up production. I actually, I, I don't even work at a nonprofit, I mean, I do, but I work at an actual school, but I work at a private school. And even for a private school, it has been a challenge for us to get the headsets that we need to be able to roll this out on a larger level. And that's not having the financial challenge of it. One of the other things that I heard earlier between um, the, the different descriptions that Ted, Isabel, uh, Brooks, and Assad uh, described was the idea of, of content for c consumption versus creators. Um, typically, I'd land more on the creation side. I love the idea of getting kids to begin to pilot storytelling and using these tools. So by the time they reach, everybody else on this panel, they have this experience and it is easier for you guys to say, all right, cool, this is the platform we're using, help us tell this story. Right. But keeping that in mind, the largest challenge, at least our school was facing, and I've seen this in a lot of other schools, is how do you bring the culture that was happening in the face-to-face -face environment to the digital space? And with some of the stuff that I've, I mean, there's stuff I've just seen, which has just blown me away, but the idea of being able to use augmented reality within primary grades to create that culture of bringing the teacher home or bringing the assembly home or even you know uh, david you were talking about watching soccer games and not being able to interact with fans how do you interact with kids in a current COVID area uh, era where you can't be in the same space with them and then if you're looking ahead the way that ted described how does this change what education looks like in general are, right. are we all moving to the neighborhood to be in that school or do we live where we want to live and we're literally choosing our educational experiences the way we would choose food in a buffet? Well, it's, well it's, that is uh, an issue. Can, can I jump in for a sec? I think it's really interesting to talk about engagement because I think in education, the education system is probably, you know, needs a lot of modernization and Zoom isn't, isn't cutting it. But engagement models have been studied in ga on the video game side for a long time, and kids are native to that world of video game interaction. Yeah. And what's really exciting is to see that the kids love sandboxes. They want to create. It comes naturally. That's why Minecraft we, is so gi gigantic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you have Minecraft, you have, you have user-generated content. And when the creation platforms and consumption platforms start to merge, is where that generation will really shine 
because I think if you if you can imagine a world where you're in a consumption streaming platform, but there's more interactivity and you've you've grown up with video games and you just know intuitively what you can do, um, that that brings the engagement level to a maximum. And it feels like like education needs that for sure. Like Emily's stuff is amazing. Kids would would be much more interested in playing in that sandbox, I imagine, than than listening to a Zoom conference. That's probably true. I'm, I'm, one of the things I think is interesting to think about is that most people, uh, so people who are really in bad shape, have a phone. And phones are continuing to be the incredibly powerful handheld computer that also lets you make a call once in a while. So if you're if you're 10 years old, you're not making a lot of phone calls. You're, you're using other ways to communicate, right? But it seems to me that one of your vector, vectors of opportunity is optimizing the mobile experience and VR and AR experiences there as opposed to more expensive standalone devices. What do you guys think about that as a thesis? Um, I can speak a bit to that as well. Um, as I said, we have these two educational experiences that were commissioned by Verizon actually that we've been developing over the last few months. Because right, they're all about the 5G opportunities and they're trying yeah, to exactly. seed all that as much as they can, right? Exactly. Um, and, you know, from our end, the intention is that, you know, the Verizon obviously has the finances. So essentially what's happening is that we're reaching out to 200 schools across the country that are where kids are on lunch programs, hence they're underserved schools, often in black and Latino backgrounds in terms of kids. Um, and we're building two experiences for them that, you know, we started off with HoloLenses and things like that, but have now, we're definitely building mobile versions for everything. And that is, you know, uh, uh, become the primary focus almost. So um, for example, one of them is called Career Day, where we have recorded interactive holograms of a bunch of uh, people in different industries, like, you know, an animator at Pixar or a designer at Google. and these are people that are from similar backgrounds as the kids and the kids can actually sit down and have a conversation with the hologram and ask them questions. So this is more in terms of consumption, kind of a virtual career day of sorts. Um, but we also have this other experience called Aurelia, which kind of, you know, is more focused on creation as well. Um, so essentially the kids see their classroom flood up with water and uh, it ends up all being- the Titanic like, experience, right? Yeah, it's basically the it's icebergs the, uh, coming, you know, like at any moment now. Um, I can actually share my screen very briefly as well, if you're okay. fine with that. Um, uh, are you guys able to see this right now? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. yeah. So this is, for example, one of those experiences that I was just referring to, that your room actually fills up with water, and we're building multiple different environments and ecosystems that kids are learning about. Um, this is pelagic ecosystem, you know, this is more like temperate river water kind of solution. And then you have coral reefs as well. And essentially, you're still in your room, you're still in your classroom. And uh, the way we do it is that the kids can actually learn from the ecosystem and design their own fish and choose the properties of the fish that will work well in those ecosystems and then populate the ecosystems with the fish and be able to see their friends fish as well and things like that. Okay, so build your own fish is definitely uh, way up there on the list with build your own dinosaur. Um, Brooks, I'm curious because you guys are trying to take VR into the artist world. This comes back to a couple of interesting questions that are related to some of the things about letting the artists who are creators in Hollywood, like the TED deals with and the game creators and the kids that Isabel and Emily and Kwaku deal with and Asad. Um, the interfaces and the opportunities in the uh, really in, in in the artist's world because uh, there are some fairly um, tech savvy artists out there and have been for years doing all kinds of interesting going back to video artists and well for that matter just using different representation versus non representative art is is sort of right. Hacking stuff, but this is the next frontier. Uh, we've seen things like uh, oh gosh, I'm I'm blanking out on the the, the carne carne e uh, the, carne the, arena, which was carne arena. Thank yeah. you. Uh, that piece at, at LACMA by uh, the great Mexican director um, and many many other uh, projects starting to bubble up. But it's still got to be things like how do you how do you teach them how do you seed these artists with these opportunities I mean, what's that well, 
a, a lot of that comes from uh, sort of stepping back and one of the things uh, I'm a big believer in is that uh, what we're doing now and what we've been doing with VR is bringing the language of other mediums to it. And by building the tool sets built on those other mediums into VR, we're actually uh, hobbling virtual reality at the language level of what it's intended to do. This is like um, the radio play for early TV kind of thing, right? Yes, it's a, the, the first films were basically plays that were shot very, very flat. Uh, when my, whenever I give talks, I always bring up Great Train Robbery when the audience was furious that there was an edit cut. Like how, <laughs> how are people ever gonna, ever gonna pay attention to what's happening? How will you ever know? Right. The, the reality is with VR and a lot of the tools people are creating are built on what I would call traditional uh, content, whether it's it's the cl traditional filmmaking pipeline, which works great for making films. I, I work for James Cameron. Dude knows what he's doing. The people underneath him really know he's his shit. Okay. He's they, got they've fun. done fine. And on the game side of things, on the game side of things, people know how to make Grand Theft Auto. They know how to make Apex and Call of Duty. Like we have these languages that do very well, but at a, at their first level, they're about how the audience is perceiving the art that they're interacting with. That's the only thing that matters in all of the creation that we may do. It's about that perception moment. And in VR, we have a unique place that we can play with because we are actually literally interacting with the direct perception of how a person views themselves as a creature of agency within any given space. And when we're talking about education or when we're talking about how people view art, uh, we can literally build the actual reality of, okay, we're gonna have a museum, we're gonna have these big walls and it's gonna be a tiny little sign next to a big painting. We're gonna do that 40 times. And we're gonna have you have to go to an elevator and go up again and then give a ticket for that other exhibit. And we can do that and, and that works and people generally understand that, but it's actually counterintuitive. Most people don't want that. They don't wanna represent themselves inside of a social dynamic they're unaware of. They don't wanna be around people they don't know unless they're certain how they're going to deal with them. They don't want themselves to be represented in a space unless they know. Uh, it's the same way when you go out uh, to, to the club or to the museum or to an art gallery opening or a concert, you dress a particular way to fit that. And so all of these things go into how you're going to deal with anyone else in the social structure. I, I come from a background of Belusian film theory, so all of this sort of stems from that. But in virtual reality, we have an exceptional responsibility as creators to build tool sets that enable us to enable people who may not come from that. So if we want to get serious about how uh, poor black and Mexican communities can actually be creating, we need to be very, very self-aware that we're building tools that were created originally by white dudes for white dudes with white dudes thinking about it. And as we start pushing into those other places and enabling creators to really play inside of that, the languages that are developed need to be inclusive. There's a wonderful book called Mismatched about how uh, when we design, we are naturally being uninclusive and we need to be thinking about that. And with VR, that's one of the first tacks Verbi's taking. Music, to be very specific, when you're talking about, uh, we're, we're working with a lot of rap artists. The, the, their fans come from all walks of life. It's also the white audiences, it's the black audiences, it's everyone. Rap's massive right now. Uh, but if we were to design sort of one size fits all as if it's something I would enjoy, pretty much immediately we're hobbling ourselves and we're hobbling our artists and our users. So it's about giving them tool sets that are designed from the ground up to enable their language, not to enable a language that's foreign to them. Okay. Um, I, I, I agree with I would I agree with that. And I think it's great that the idea here is that people should be able to customize their, their world. World building should be flexible enough to accommodate all kinds of, uh, of themes and styles and cultures, um, which, is, which, is, which is really inclusive and exciting, especially when you're taking, even, even directors come from an analog film world can come into the 21st century and actually produce animation in a game engine. We worked with a veteran director on Baymax Dreams for Disney, and he was just, floored by how collaborative it was and how flexible it allowed him to be when when improvising the world that he wanted to build hey can we put the street there we can oh my god it's happened instantly right right it's terrific i mean to put that kind of power into everyone's hands is 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 i think a, 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 our our role in, as tech as the tech community to sort of democratize the power of technology for all cultures. 
Well, I think that's a that's a great that's a great goal. I'm curious uh, uh, as we look at all the VR AR universe. Uh, one of the places where it has been out in the public and at a high level and accessible is in location based entertainment. Expensive, not often easily accessible to everybody because it's tucked away in some storefront or some tourist area or whatever. But that business seems to me to be particularly vulnerable to the impacts of the lockdown and all that. Uh, looking forward, does that, does, as this business continues to evolve, does, does the location-based entertainment sector have a, have a future? Um, and what do you guys think about that? So all of these things have a future, including location-based entertainment. It is a, a subset of theme park entertainment, right? And if you view it that way and view it through that lens, when we emerge from this current state into a state where we do have a vaccine and we have the ability to get back to a, a social dynamic in, in the real world, location-based will come back to life uh, as a viable entertainment choice. Will it be the first viable entertainment choice to come back? No. Um, it'll be further down that food chain. Uh, will the, the, the many companies that have started with various levels of funding and various ideas in the earliest stages of, of trying to build this into a business uh, survive? Many of them will not. Uh, a lot of the talent will survive and they will probably re-emerge into other companies and other uh, entities, which is, uh, by the way, happened well before COVID. I mean, you see right. all kinds of build, rebuild, reuse, regenerate, and the funding gets burned, the use case gets changed, and the talent continues to re-emerge and show themselves into new entities. And I think that's what's going to happen with the evolution of LBE and just as a subset of, the, of a giant multi-multi-billion uh, dollar industry, which is out of the home entertainment, which includes theme parks, concerts. Uh, yeah, I, I would echo, Ted, I think if you want to talk about something in 2022, that is a, a, something that we can't imagine. I don't know what it looks like. It's going to be LBE. There's going to be something, and it's certainly not what we had a year ago. It really won't be what we had a year ago. But I think what's interesting, what Isabel is referring to and what you guys were talking about, about uh, Minecraft culture and Fortnite culture and CSGO culture, is that people are getting much, much, much more comfortable with virtual socialization. They are understanding the value of it. It is emerging from strictly youth culture into a wider, broader audience because the wider, broader audience is doing a modified version of it, which is this, right? And mm -hmm. if you sort of think about how long it took us to get to how seamless this is in our daily use case of video chat as a communication tool, 45, 50 years, right, in the making to get it this good, this seamless, and with so many different options. I'm sure you all go through the same crazy dynamics that I do because I literally use every video chat client on the planet on a daily basis. And they all have their own little nuances. Right. Like what button to click where and what, you know, so we're like, the law of seven is that the minute there's a good idea, there are seven tech companies that build a mirrored product of that same thing. And right. you have to learn them all, right? And some, and in China, another 70 companies yeah, just do, do a mirror. Uh, so what's, that what's is interesting interesting on the, What's interesting on the Zoom front, because we're using Zoom here, this, some people might not know this, Zoom's valuation today is larger than the seven largest airlines combined. So without any real sense of how they're going to monetize on a $50 billion valuation. But that is just that, you know, talk about the world turned upside down sort of statistic, right? Well, well, we won't get into the craziness of the stock market over the last few months. We'll, we'll leave that one alone. But uh, more generally, uh, this will be an interesting time. Um, is everybody here expect to see a much bigger VR space woven and AR woven in? I'm curious about what you think. Uh, and this will probably be the last sort of big question. What do things like 5G and, and uh, the new mobile technology, the Apple yesterday, so people know about when we were talking about this, uh, did not talk about its 5G enabled phones that everybody expects will come out and be, be announced and, and come out sometime this fall. Uh, but they are coming and the big three carriers uh, are working hard, spending tens of billions of dollars to build out their 5G networks and ahead of Apple 5G. Uh, just curious what you guys think that means for um, VR, AR becoming part of our everyday. At the same time, I also want to know what you guys think about the new consoles, the new game consoles, 
which have been a vector for some immersive experiences of many kinds. Those two things are all going to hit this fall. And where do you think those guys are going? And will they move beyond entertainment and gaming into other spaces like education? Let's start with you, Kwaku and Emily. Emily, do you want to speak first? Um, yeah, I, I can for sure. I mean, I think, you know, especially with the, the game consoles, I am, I would love to get a PlayStation these days, but um, <laughs> <laughs> probably can't tell that brand. You're probably going to cut it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, in, in terms of what we're doing, which is, you know, we, we, we need to get students and kids to be able to build together inside that same virtual environment. And with 5G, that's probably going to be going to be extremely helpful to, to be able to do that and have more, more users in and, you know, things like, you know, I know if you've all been in Fortnite or, you know, those kinds of experiences have, have done things that aren't necessarily completely gamey, like concerts. Um, Minecraft is huge for, for education right now. They're, they've been doing graduations in there, which is completely right. completely crazy. Teachers have started to build things in there um, slowly but surely, trying to understand how it works. But um, you know, the and really, you know, it's not even it's not even what the education, the top down education is going. I mean, I think part of what you guys have been talking about with Minecraft to me, we have trained a whole generation of world builders, right? they're just playing games and building their little worlds in Minecraft. And then they're graduating up to Fortnite and they're graduating up to the next or Roblox and the next game. But to them working in 3d spaces and building an experience is what you do. Right. And, and that's great for unity and it's great for all you other guys trying to find talent that's coming up. The 17 year old kid who's doing some incredible thing, but, Minecraft is just the thing you do. And it's interesting to say that 2% of all the YouTube videos out there a year ago were Minecraft videos. 2% of everything on YouTube was a Minecraft video, which is insane. Because if you know how much video is there, that's an crazy amount of stuff. So we're, we're a training a whole generation of world builders. Yeah, and I think we're going to be, instead of like connecting in YouTube, or we're just going to be meeting in those worlds and experiencing different types of things. And that's going to be, I think, for me, it's super exciting. And we've already seen that with the with the pandemic. My, my team and I were separated. So they're in Switzerland and Europe, and I'm in LA. And I don't know, for some reason during pandemic, we started, you know, experiencing, doing virtual experiences together that are on Yahoo's Quest and VR, and then doing those things that we would actually didn't really do before but became super engaging for us. So regularly now, every two days, we're gonna just try and, you know, try something new and be together in that space. And that's kind of unique to the world we're, we're in now, but it's, I think it's exciting and it's gonna be fun for a lot of people, you know, the, in the next two to three years. Okay, well, what do you think, Kwaku? These technology things that are big technology things that have some potential impact, what, where's that gonna be taking us? Where, how are they gonna help? So actually, I want to echo something that Isabel said earlier, the idea of using mobile devices. I think it was Isabel or maybe yeah. Brooks. Um, the idea of using mobile devices for virtual experiences. 5G is going to automatically power up a ton of schools, just as far as the accessibility and what and the hardware that they currently have, which is, for the most part, tablets, desktops, laptops. And yeah, but you're not going to have to rewire the school, for instance, to take advantage of 5G. You put a couple of fixed wireless exactly. dead ends yeah. and boom, you've got that, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then as far as the gaming piece that you discussed, that is just amazing as well, because it's just building upon, you know, we, in education, we refer to students of a certain age as digital natives. They've grown up with this. And so we would always refer to that as far as working online using a website, but the idea of having uh, digital natives who are used to building things virtually, that is a game changer as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Because when we, right now, when we introduce kids to it, like, oh, this is great. This is like Legos, but I'm doing it this way. Or they find some sort of analogy, which, which equates in their mind really easily, and then they're able to slip into it, and it feels natural. But the idea of kids coming in, and I see it now, I have some kids who are 3D designers who are coming in with those skill sets who are just like, all right, this is really great. This is what I do. How can you help me go further with it? And right. the idea of that being a like, base. Pick it up, Grandpa. I'm, I'm ready yes, to roll. Man. Yeah. No, I don't even try to keep oh, up. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm just like, what do you need? Yeah, all right. How can I get out of the way? <laughs> and I'm going to get you the gear, the software, the space, and then create the context for you to be as creative as possible. As possible. But the idea of the gaming systems, building that into the next – not even the next, the current generation and every other group of kids that are coming up, that's just going to make those kids way more talented by the time they reach the level where they'd be working with Ted Brooks 
Emily or Assad. Yeah, uh, Isabel, real quickly, because you're uh, in the innovations lab there at Unity, how are you all incorporating this into your all's sort of plans and, and, and long-term expectations for your products and where you're going? Um, we're, we're definitely working on, on advanced learning tools and all kinds of solutions for film and animation so that people are able to create a film, you know, separately, remotely, but collaborating in the same space. That, that's something we're committed to. But we're also, and I hadn't had an opportunity to mention it before, we're, we're working a lot with AI and machine learning. Um, we're, we're, we're integrating computer vision. We're building smart assets that like a chair knows it's a chair. So if you put it into a room, it, it will automatically identify with a table and a floor. Um, this feels like philosophy more than technology. Chair, <laughs> but yeah, but the, the I, idea of the chair knowing itself. Wow. Yeah, yeah no, it's, it's but it's about yeah. simplifying creation so that it becomes very intuitive and anybody can do it. So, so to be able to leverage very powerful innovation and and apply it to a simple task is is definitely what we're trying uh, to do, and I think that the the type of infrastructure we've put together with regard to the cloud and the commitment to multi-platform integrations uh, means that 5G is going to bring to everyone the ability to have real-time interactive content on their phone anywhere anytime and uh that kind of thing unlocks uh, a whole new generation of content um and it's content like we talked about that has a bit more of a sandboxy feel it's content that sees you that knows you um and reacts so so all of that is very very exciting we've got a um a huge team of futurists and and we're always sort of trying to uh, listen to our creators and understand what they need with keeping this eye on the horizon line there. Great. Um, real quickly, uh, I'm gonna let Brooks, Assad, and Ted have a, a last word too. Any thoughts you guys may have about where this business is going and what it means for the things that you do? And then we'll wrap this puppy up. Brooks, why don't you take a shot at uh, what some of the new technologies, AI, 5G, the consoles and their power. Uh, We're hitting a unique time. Like, like this is uh, whatever may happen in the time before this airs. The last few months have put us in a very unique place where the world is shifting. And in the last month, we're seeing world shifting even more. However you may feel about the police, we know things are going to be changing. Things are not letting up. There's going to be shifts in a lot of different places in our society. And from a technology perspective, the timing's there for us to be able to support this. Whatever happens with police, when they... Uh, decide we're defunding the police or we're moving them into more uh, de-escalation training or we're bringing in more counselors or whatever it is. It's a lot of people who are going to have to be trained up very, very fast and we're going to need virtual and digital and immersive technologies to be able to really supplement that and be able to support it properly. Uh, and it's not just that, but entertainment across the board as we start moving into more virtual productions and democratizing the world of CG. That's the reality of what Unity and Unreal and all these guys are ultimately doing. Well, it's helping the big guys like, uh, like the Fabros of the world do Lion King and do uh, all of those wonderful films. At the same time, uh, uh, some guys I watch on YouTube made a movie in their basement, six of them, uh, and they did it completely in Blender using semi-free tools or free tools, and then rendered the whole thing out. And it was not bad. It was shocking, the level of CG and tracking and everything he had. Uh, using fo his phone to edit his face and do lip syncing. It's crazy. Soderberg, Soderbergh's can... done amazing stuff with, uh, I, I love that he was shooting, uh, what was his last film he shot, The High Flying Bird? He shot with vintage iPhone 8, you know, because he liked the look of the iPhone 8 over the 11 or something like that, you know? <laughs> Only Soderbergh, but... We're in a place where technology and all this stuff is is impinging upon, I think, a really good perfect storm of shifts in society that are going to yield some very interesting outcomes. And I'm really excited to be a part of it. Interesting. So, what are your thoughts? Um, I usually just like to work with whatever is interesting in that very moment. So, you know, we were doing tremendous amount of location-based kind of work two years ago, two or three years ago. Now there's none of that. And I don't expect to do any of that anytime soon either. Part of it was a natural shift 
you saw funding actually moving around, you realize that funding is not going to those kind of places in the same way it was before. Um, and then obviously with COVID, like the idea of sharing headsets with people, that's just, you know, not really an option anymore. Um, what we are doing right now is these 5G based mobile experiences. And, you know, it's kind of funny because we've been playing with the HoloLens 2 for the last six, seven months as well. But, you know, I used to swear by headset based AR and I said, I'm never going to touch mobile AR ever. And here we are, like, just almost exclusively working with mobile AR because that is what's reaching audiences. Um, and with Jadu, you know, we're kind of taking a bet and we're, we're building a library of hundreds of volumetric holograms that are known to be heavy objects that are hard to stream that, you know, that you're kind of, you're taking the bet and relying on the fact that uh, people's speeds and phones would be good enough over the next two or three years to be flexibly be able to run all of this stuff. So, you know, um, from our perspective, um, it's, it's really important to do work right now that, you know, uh, speaks to younger people, um, really like Gen Z, teenagers, 13, 14 year old people. That is really the audience that will be uh, immersive first in that sense that when they're in their early 20s, they will actually be doing jobs and, you know, will be uh, engaged in a society that a lot of which is working virtually. So that's really our focus. And we want to build things that are fun, that kind of enhance and enable creativity and I think that a really important thing that I'm happy it's come up a bunch of times on this panel is that um, we got we got to do all of this in a way where it's not shying from being political. And you know, our work has been political from day one. But same, I feel like the time of building kind of a political neutral tech companies is over. And um, I can rejoice at least. Um, I think that uh, the platforms we're building need to have a voice um, and need to take stance uh, in a way that hasn't been necessary before. And I'll end on this note of what Brooks was saying about, you know, often like a lot of these platforms we build engage with black culture and especially music, like especially music. Um, and in order for us to be really conscious about all of that, I think it's really important to hire people um, that can deal with that stuff. You know, we made a hire recently that was someone who studied black studies and throughout their college time. And now they're leading the efforts on content and user generated content on, on the app. And I think that that's like really one of the only things that we can do as tech companies to kind of engage more people in the conversation. Um, yeah. Thank God that somebody with a liberal, a liberal arts degree can still get hired by a tech company. Who knew that was possible? But that's great. My whole, my whole tech company is liberal arts people. We yeah, don't have I, a I think that's good. I mean, I think that's probably, it's <clears> not been honored as much, it's been honored mostly in the breach in recent years, I think, as we understandably try to encourage STEM education, but there's definitely, uh, a need for a broader education. Ted, we'll give you the final word as the futurist looking in the future. What are these technologies like AI, AR, and the new consoles mean for where we're going to be in the next year and a half? What do you, what do you think? Sure. Well, as you know, David, my a big part of my life is is approaching things with a with a ten year curve, right? So these days, I'm looking at what 2030 looks like. Certainly, this version of 2020 that we are living in now has put certain accelerators on things that were actually moving slower, that are actually speeding up, but it hasn't really fundamentally changed the equation of what 2020 to 2030 looks like. Uh, in terms of the end of the smartphone era and the beginning of the smart wearable era is starting to happen. And we're gonna start to see in the next three, six, nine, and then up until that 2030 timeframe, breaking out of this magic window, breaking out of that rectangle into something that is more immersive, more spatial, and works the way our brains and our eyes work. So I think Brooks was bringing this up before when you talked about the transition from media step to media step and how media steps tend to rely on the past media step to sort of guide their understanding of the future. And then actually new media approaches start to find their first little nuggets of hit mentality and the new things start to emerge that are actually using the tools in the ways that the capabilities allow. So I think the, the idea of mobile AR is only just a step in time. It's not particularly engaging and it's not particularly interesting. Um, I think it's just a moment that teaches us a certain behavior 
that when we start to wear something that gives us a digital layer in, on top of our reality at full, sale, full scale and full size, that's when things start to really get interesting. And the time that the companies like Unity and Unreal and the smaller startups invest today using the tools that I would say are kind of inappropriate to achieve that objective are the ones that will learn how to achieve that objective. So that's essentially what I study. Uh, and to go all the way back to the beginning of this, that is the effective frog kissing, is you are constantly looking at things that don't make a lot of sense today, but will probably make a lot of sense tomorrow. And that's a good place to stop this. Thank you all so much. We lost a couple of our folks right there at the end with hard outs. I really appreciate your all's time. And uh, have a happy virtual San, uh, San Diego Comic-Con, wherever you may be Comic-Conning. This is David Bloom. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.